nature not, I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case, open and shut No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut Today we'll go bird watching, tomorrow we'll catch toads The next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut that's why I'm a nature nut Well, I'm a nature nut I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things And I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case Open and shut No doubt about it I'm a nature nut Hello, nature nuts. How are you doing today? Me, I'm feeling a little bit small and insignificant. I don't know why, maybe it's because I'm about to break with tradition. Usually I show you some aspect of nature study that anybody can do themselves, but today, well, we've got an opportunity to use a bit of technology that is so big and expensive, you and I will never own one ourselves. It's called a scanning electron microscope. They cost about $400,000. Now, if you're at all like me and you like to read nature books and magazines, eventually you'll come across these incredible pictures from the scanning electron microscope. You look at the torso of a little tiny bug and you see every, every lens in the eye, every little pore, every little hair, every little detail. It's beautiful, beautiful stuff. So let's find out how these things work and what they look like and what you can do with them. And by the way, People in the know call them SEMs. SEMs. Don't call them SIMs. Just call them SEMs. Okay, well now before we get any further, let's review a basic thing. We all know what a microscope looks like, right? It looks kind of like this. This is my personal microscope. It's a nice little microscope. I use it all the time. It's a light microscope, which means that it functions... Uh, by using light. It's also a dissecting microscope, which means that, um, well, when I turn the light on, the light bounces off the specimen. In this case, you see that nice little 70 million year old shark tooth, fossil shark tooth. And I look through the eyepieces, I focus with the focus knob, and I see the light that is reflected off the specimen. I see it in three dimensions. I see it as if I were a very tiny, tiny person. But you notice there are some things that this microscope cannot do. If you look through the eyepieces here, the magnification is good, but it's not that high. The, about the, the highest magnification I can get here is about 50 times actual size. And uh, you oftentimes need much more magnification than that. As well, I can't get the point of the tooth and the root of the tooth in focus at the same time. I have to focus up and down because we don't have much of what we call depth of field in a light microscope. That's why the professionals like to use the scanning electron microscope from time to time. It, uh, it's a beautiful thing. It's nothing at all like a light microscope. It's got nothing but depth of field, incredible magnification, beautiful detail. Let's go have a look at one right now. The first scanning electron microscope was constructed in 1948 in the United States of America. Okay, well now we're ready to have a look at the real thing. And I am in the University of Alberta's Earth and Atmospheric Sciences Field Emission Scanning Electron Microscope Facility, which is a very familiar place for me because I used to spend a lot of time in this room looking at the mandibles of beetles. So let's have a look here. I'm gonna introduce you to George Braybrook, my old friend. Nice Hi, to be John. back here. Uh, but this is, a, this is a brand new machine from, from my old. Yeah, here, a new technology. What 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 is all of this stuff up here, though? Oh well, we have a, a gun at the top that produces an electron beam, accelerate the electron beam through the column, which are a series of electromagnetic lenses, and down into the chamber where the sample is. The sample goes through this airlock to a spot underneath the uh, 
electron beam. The beam excites the surface of the sample and we collect secondary electron emission through this photomultiplier. The camera, so to speak? That's the camera's eye. So whatever's going on inside there, we can see on this television screen. All right, so, so we have a little this, video the scope. specimen is right up on that little the specimen stub is up there. on that stub and the electron beam is coming down through there. Mm -hmm. We can uh, back out and have a look at some of these pollen grains. And what about the magnification that you can achieve with this microscope? Quite versatile. These scanning electron microscopes can go from about 10 times magnification all the way up to several hundred thousand times, depending on what material is you're looking at. Now, the thing that I find really interesting is that it's not quite like photography. You're not looking at reflected electrons, are you? You're looking at, what do you call it, secondary electrons? Secondary electrons, yeah. The electron beam, when it strikes the surface of the sample, it excites the electrons that are actually in the sample. and excites those secondary electrons so much that they escape from the surface of the sample in a little cloud. The little cloud of secondary electrons that we excite out of the surface of the sample are what we collect to produce an image on the television screen. Well, thank you for this tour, George. This is, uh, this is a neat, neat machine. I can hardly wait to see the next one you get in here. Oh, yes, it'll be an interesting machine. The technology is always advancing. Beautiful. Early SEMs required a separate feed from the power company. Now you simply plug them into the wall. Hello, scientists, both young and old. Say, wouldn't this be a good time to review the process by which a biological specimen is made ready for examination? You guessed it, within the scanning electron microscope. Yes, indeed. Let's mock up the process, beginning with the acquisition of an interesting biological specimen. Whoa, there's one now. A large bug of undetermined identity. Say, that looks like a beauty. First thing you do is you clean off all of the wilderness gunk that has accumulated on the exterior surface of the bug using an ultrasonic cleaner, which is essentially a vibrating washing machine, which vibrates at a very high rate of vibrations per second. Hey, bug! Hold on! Get ready! Oh, vibrations so fast they cannot be heard by the human ear. Ultrasonic, that's what they're called. Oh, yes indeed. It's still vibrating, in fact. Whoa, boy, hold on. Be very careful not to handle it with your fingers at this point, or you will add new gunk to the specimen. And now, we put it in the critical point drying apparatus. Very important, very very important. Sparklingly clean. Now the first step in the critical point drying process is to immerse the specimen in alcohol. Ethanol we call it. <laughs> and the whole point of critically point drying the specimen is to prevent it from becoming shrivelly and prune-like in the drying process. After all, who would want to look at a shrivelly and prune-like insect. At this point, the alcohol is replaced with liquid carbon dioxide. <laughs> I don't know what liquid carbon dioxide looks like, come to think of it. Pretend this is it. <laughs> at this time, we reach what is called the critical point in critical point drying, when the carbon dioxide is removed, drawn off, under conditions of a vacuum. The carbon dioxide goes from a liquid to a gaseous form without creating the sort of interface that would wrinkle delicate membranes. There we go, not a wrinkle to be seen. And now, the final stage, sputter coating. 
And now the perfectly clean, perfectly dry, perfectly wrinkle-free specimen is attached to a mounting stub and the entire combination thereof is coated with a very thin layer of pure gold. Mm, not too much, not too much. This is very important in an electrical sense, the details of which we need not concern ourselves with right now. At this point, finally, the specimen is placed again in a vacuum, or in this case, on a vacuum, and <laughs> a cathode ray gun is used to scan the specimen with the electrons. Have you ever seen a cathode ray gun? <laughs> Neither have I. Imagine it looks like this. In a wink of an eye, the electrons, may I have the electron detector, please? The electrons are picked up by a detector and the resulting images, something like photographic images, are a marvel to behold. Thank you very much, my faithful assistant technician. Every scanning electron microscope needs a technician. Look at the detail, the depth of field. Incredible! There you have it, the process in a nutshell. Well, you know I love looking at insects. I'll bet you do too. No big surprise. But there's only so much you can see with your naked eye, especially when you're looking at something as small as ladybugs. Yeah, even with a magnifying glass, looking at ladybugs like this, you get more questions than answers. But you know, with the scanning electron microscope, you can see so many more things. Like, I mean, we know that ladybugs spend most of their time walking around on plants, but man, the detail in their feet. They're not just feet. I mean, these are really snappy feet. The claws at the end of each uh, series of toes on the end of the foot, the claws have this beautifully, um, well, they're, they're two-pointed. Each claw is two-pointed, and there are lovely little ridges on it. You can see how that claw would be very good at digging into the surface of a leaf. And as well, if you look at the, the segment of the toes just back from the one with the claws, it has this wonderful, very dense mat of hairs on it. And if you look in closer at the hairs, you'll see that the tip of each hair is expanded into a little sort of a spoon-like structure. And that little spoon-like structure, it's a sticky surface that's the way that, uh, that the, the feet of a ladybug allow it to walk up leaves, walk up glass, whatever. It's also the same sort of thing that uh, some lizards have on their feet. Then if you look at the mouth parts of these incredible beetles, not the jaws, but the little palps, the little feelers below the jaws, and at the end of each palp, there's a, a segment that has a little sort of a groove in it, and in the groove are little hairs, and at the tips of those hairs, you can see little tiny, well, they're kind of like taste buds. We wouldn't call them taste buds, but that's what they are. Taste buds for tasting aphids. Isn't that amazing? Then you look at the eyes, you can see each one of the lenses in the surface of the eye, and under each lens is a separate, um, well, an entomologist call it an omatidium, but you and I would call it a separate eyeball. Weird, eh? Wonderful. Incredible things that you can see only when you get one of these critters under the old SEM and have a really good close look at it. It's just amazing that something that small can be super detailed even when you blow it up a couple of hundred times with the SEM. No matter how much you crank that knob, there's still something cool to see. Even the smallest insects have millions of cells in their bodies, and they are intricate, complex creatures. Space Base Zeta. Space Base Zeta, do you read me? This is Space Agent Biff Meteor. I'm surrounded by an alien scout force in orbit around the planetoid Kinopodiaceae, I believe. After all, I do feel a sneeze coming on. 
My space titanium suit is holding up for the moment, but perhaps not much longer. Oh, you know, sometimes when you're working on the scanning electron microscope, it's a lot like being in a really bad black and white science fiction movie. And boy, for me, that's a great place to be because I love those old movies. I just love them. Ah, most of the time when this happens, you're looking at pollen grains. Now, pollen grains, they're beautiful things under the SCM. And you know what pollen is. Pollen is the dusty stuff in flowers that gets either blown around by the wind or stuck to bugs or birds or bats, and then it fertilizes other flowers. And every type of plant has its own characteristic type of pollen grain. And the pollen grains are beautiful, beautiful things because they have, uh, they have this very durable surface, and the surface has often a, a wonderful texture to it. Some of them are very geometric, some of them have pits and craters, some of them have big spikes and, and uh, bridges and you know, canals and stuff in them. Very, very asteroidy looking. Of course, pollen does have its negative aspects. Many of us, myself included, we are allergic to various kinds of pollen which is why I do a lot of sneezing on this show. Space Base Zeta, Space Base Zeta, do you read me? The alien fleet has armed its warhead. I am in immediate mortal danger. Beam me out of here, Space Base Zeta. Beam me out of here, do you read me? Beam me out of here. Oh, that's fine. I'll just walk. <laughs> the differences among pollen grains prevent each type of pollen from fertilizing the wrong type of flower. Day. Open it up and see what it say. Dear John, it reads on the very first line. Oh, good reason nearly blew my mind. She says she don't love me, but I hope she only just forgot. I can't imagine, but maybe not. Well, I couldn't believe it, so I looked again. Read between the lines, and that's an awful pain. I had a vision what I had to do. Examine that letter with And I bought me a bunch of broken down stereos and electronic junk Burned out TVs and a techno room To make a scanning electron microscope in my roughest room I know she don't love me, but what have I got to lose? Just the blues, boy, just the blues Later, it was ready to rock. I put the letter in the chamber and I turned on the atomic clock. I looked at the screen, what do I see? A molecule of love near the top of page three. She must still love you. She sent you a molecule of love. Like a message on a store I dove. So I called up my baby. I said, here's the proof. She said, John, you don't know nothing, you technological goof. That ain't my molecule. <laughs> it could have rubbed off the mailbox for they could have rubbed off the mailbox. Man, oh man, I peeled that thing off the house like it's an old tin can. I look under the scope and what do I find? The thing is crawling with love and the love is all mine. It was the letter carrier, the <laughs> barrier of the molecules of love. Oh, baby, anybody hurt? I think you ought to marry her. The evidence says it's you. She's really You love. can't argue with science. It's a contamination of love. There's molecules everywhere. So, George, after 25 years of working on the scanning electron microscope, you have to have some favorite images, don't you? 
Yeah, we've taken a lot of images in the last few years, and these are the sorts of things we mainly get uh, from the SEM. Here's my favorite beetle shot in black and white, which is what we get from the SEM. Remarkably handsome. We can go into artificial color in different realms. These are niobium arsenide crystals. Neat, very neat. Again, in the crystal world, we have a zircon crystal, the near diamond. And look, you can see every little imperfection of this near diamond, all, too. <laughs> all the surface details. That's, That's what this machine That's really beautiful. does well, is give you surface detail. And into the insect world again, we have a mosquito larvae. It was originally one, but he needed some uh, pals to dance with, so we got multiplied him with the... Bit, bit of a kick line? That's nice, that's <laughs> nice. You must get a little bored in here from time well, to time. Well, sometimes you can get a little artistic <laughs> license. We're not all science here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, that's good to see. So we can also go into the world of microfossils. This is a radiolarian, uh, several hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of years old. And he would be made of silicon. Originally, it would be colored white. But I think he looks much better as a little alien oh, spaceship, course, don't very you? very alien to me, yeah. Bizarre. And that's just the shell of a little microorganism. That's right. It was a living organism many, many years ago, pulled out of the rock and mounted up, uh, examined with the SEM. And we can get into the arthropod world as well. This is Mytel Jordan. Mytel Jordan. <laughs> As colored by Susan Bjorns. This is too many hours looking at the screen. That's what <laughs> Susan, she's funny. She's one of the funniest people I know. Yeah, you know, that's the beautiful thing about exploring the natural world with this high technology stuff. You just never know what you're going to see. That's why I like it. That's why I'm a nature nut. I hope you are too. I know he is. See you again soon. <laughs> if you got any more. <laughs>